All right, so thank you everyone, first off, for attending. This is our second ever real estate program here at Yale SOM, sponsored by International Center for Finance. So I'm your host and moderator today. I'm, I'm Cameron LaPointe. I teach real estate finance, which is an MBA elective course. Maybe some of you will take it in the spring if you're interested. Um, just a shameless plug there. Um, and really what the goal is today is to talk about perhaps one of the most pressing economic issues um, facing the U.S. economy today, that is the housing affordability crisis. And so just to give you an outline of how today is going to go, I'm going to do some very brief facts and figures just to kind of set the stage for what we mean by the housing affordability crisis. And then I'm going to turn it over to our expert panelists who are all SOM alums um, who have devoted their careers to working on this issue um, to tell us where they see things going and, and hopefully outline some policy recommendations. So um, before I, I formally introduce them, let me just kind of show you some what we're talking about when we mean housing affordability. So I think there's a lot of different definitions that get thrown out in the media. Um, but I think perhaps a natural first step is just to look at what's been going on with house prices over time. So this is the Housing and Urban Development House Price Series. This is for homes sold since 1963 up until today. And this is real um, dollar value, so this is adjusted for inflation, so relative to the average cost of goods in the economy. And the takeaway here is that the median U.S. home price has more than tripled since this series began in 1963, even relative to the cost of other goods in the economy. Now you might say, okay, well that's the home ownership market. What about the renter market? Fortunately, we don't have data going back that far on, on what leasing costs have looked like over time. But at least in the last 20 or so years, the pattern is strikingly similar. Okay. So that's one measure. But you might say, like, well, but incomes have also gone up over this time. So does that really mean that housing has become more unaffordable for the average American? Well, yes. So another measure that we could use to, to answer that question is the price to income ratio. So this is how many years do I essentially need to save up on average? in order to buy a typical home in my area. Okay. So let's start by looking at what the price to income ratio looked like in 1980. So you can see there's already a lot of geographic dispersion and how unaffordable different areas are, according to this measure. So on average, you've got price to income ratio in this two to three range, so meaning I need to save up two to three years of annual income to buy a house. And you can already see that there's some parts of Florida and the coast of California with much higher price to income ratios, meaning that they're more unaffordable. So that's 1980. Let's fast forward to a map in the pre-COVID period. Okay, so a lot less blue and a lot more red. So what was going on in terms of unaffordability in the California coast has spread to other parts of the southwestern US, Florida, and other high cost of living areas like the DC, New York, and Boston metro areas. Okay. And now we're talking about some areas where you have eight to 10 years of annual income you need to save up to buy a house. Okay. Now, what is driving this? So one thing that I hope we're going to get into today during our discussion is um, that housing costs are positively related to how strict local land use regulation and zoning is. Okay. So if you just look at this plot, we have some summary measure here that's produced by a group of scholars at Wharton. Um, that reflects basically how much, as a developer, do I have to go through in terms of local town planning processes, filing for permits, et cetera, in order to build new residential um, units. Okay, so San Jose, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, all of these high cost of living areas that showed up on the previous map are going to also score very high on this regulatory stringency index. You can all see this translates to construction of new homes, particularly what I'll call entry level or starter homes. So these are homes that are below the average in terms of square footage, around 1,400 square feet. So people who are just buying their first home. We used to, in this country in the 1970s, build around 400,000 of these new entry level homes. And now going into COVID, we're looking at around 50 to 75,000. So these local regulations seem to be having quite a bit of bite in terms of both the profitability from the developer side of building new housing, um, as well as just the overall uh, feasibility of doing so. Finally, um, there's a clear uh, human cost to the lack of, of housing supply. Um, I think one striking figure is just to look at what's been going on with chronic homelessness um, in the US since it reached a low point in 2016. You know, that number has almost doubled um, in the years since uh, 2016. So. Um, there is a, a clear human cost to not providing enough housing for everyone. 
So with those facts and figures in mind, I, I'm hoping that we can dissect the origins of the U.S. housing affordability crisis a bit more today, identify challenges, uh, particularly those faced by private, public, and nonprofit entities, um, and then hopefully with the help of our, our panelists, outline a sustainable roadmap for local and national policymakers to help solve some of these issues. Okay. So that's enough from me. Now I want to introduce our panelists. Um, so first off, we have Ramon Jacobson, class of 98, SOM. Um, he's the executive director of LISC DC. Um, LISC is a national community development finance institution working towards preserving economic diversity. Um, under uh, Ramon's tenure at LISC, he's managed more than $400 million in CDFI fund investments, loans, grants, um, and tax credit equity. And he has a, a long career working on, on issues related to um, supplying affordable housing, including starting his career working in the late 1980s uh, New York City shelter system trying to get single adults off the streets. Um, he also serves on the Board of Preservation of Affordable Housing in Boston, among other boards with synergistic interests in the topics today. Uh, he has a BA from Harvard and an MBA from, of course, Yale SOM. So welcome, Ramon. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And we also have Jolie Anler Milstein joining us today, um, class of 84 SOM. Uh, she's the president and CEO of the New York State Association for Affordable Housing, which is the largest affordable housing trade group in the country. Um, and she has a wealth of experience prior to her time at um, NYSA FAH um, as a developer at, at Praxis Housing Initiatives and executive director of the Ulster County Development Corporation. Um, a commercial and residential investment banker at First Boston Corporation and project architect at More Rubel Udall Architects. Um, she has a bachelor's in architecture from UC Berkeley, a master's in architecture from UCLA, and an MBA from Yale SOM. So welcome, Julie. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, we have Peter Simons joining us, um, class of 82, Yale College, and uh, class of 89, SOM. Um, so Peter recently retired after seven years as CEO of Homemade America, which is one of the largest national providers of housing for the homeless. Um, and during Peter's tenure as, as CEO of Homemade, um, Homemade completed 457 housing projects valued at almost 200 million, 187. And they added eight new chapters to bring Homemade America to 20 markets in 13 states. Um, Peter has 23 years of experience as a, a building industry executive prior to Homemade, including 13 years at Beezer Homes, which some of you may have heard of, one of the, the top 10 largest builders in the country. Um, and prior to, to working in the building industry, um, he spent five years as a senior legislative aide to Senator Daniel Tainoe of Hawaii, working on, of all things, housing policy, among others, if I believe. Um, and he has a BA from Yale and an MBA from Yale SOM. So welcome, Peter. Thank you for coming. <laughs> And again, welcome to all of our panelists. Really looking forward to delving into this. So um, just one final housekeeping thing before we start the discussion. We will have uh, time for a short Q&A from the audience at the end. Um, and we ask that you scan the QR code and submit your questions anonymously um, through this slide. So I'm just going to leave this up here. So throughout the talk, if, if um, you're, you're getting some ideas about things you'd like to hear more from from our panelists, um, you can just enter in through that app. Okay. Great. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, begin the discussion. Um, and I want to start off by, um, and perhaps this is maybe a little bit more geared towards Jolie, but um, so I, I want to pick out a little bit some of the, this relationship between house prices and rents and construction activity or the lack thereof. Um, you know, in particular, we've seen some areas like San Francisco with single digit permanent in recent months. And so I guess my question for you is, what works from a community advocacy perspective in terms of trying to promote certain types of policies at the expense of others? And how do we balance political feasibility with what actually works? Well, I think it's important in having a conversation about housing and supply and demand of housing to just differentiate what I work on and my industry association focuses exclusively on is affordable housing which is a category of housing that's really a public, it's Yale SOM invention, it's a, a public-private partnership where government resources in the form of tax abatements or direct subsidy or rental vouchers comes into the equation and private developers build the housing with a lot of restrictions, including restricting who can live in those buildings than the rents that they can be charged. So that, uh, that is affordable housing. There's public housing, which we don't build anymore, a different category. And then we refer to everything else pretty much as market rate, at least in New York. 
So I'm most informed about affordable housing, but affordable housing is, is the victim of a lot of downward pressure from the lack of creation of the supply of market rate housing. Because there isn't enough housing, people stay in their units longer, there's less places for people to move around to, and so we're feeling that pressure on the affordable housing stock. The other pressure is really inflation, all kinds of costs going up, which means you every dollar builds less housing. But probably the biggest problem, and I think where communities and conversations come in, is pushback by those who live in communities who no one wants change. And when communities hear special affordable housing coming in, or any sort of density, multifamily housing coming in, people push back. And leaving a decision in the hands of local residents really creates opportunity hoarding. And my main point, I think, is we have to look at zoning and land development issues at a, at a regional or state level. Yeah, I, uh, thank you. And I agree with what you're saying. Thanks for just, just like centering affordable housing in this kind of array of different uh, housing options. You know, I work for a CDFI, Community Development Finance Institution. So we're, we overlap with affordable housing, um, but we also do things like development, healthcare, uh, cultural placemaking, a variety of issues. And uh, many of the communities where, you know, my organization works are, have suffered really from disinvestment. So they are, in a way, eager for change and craving investment and development. And that's, uh, so it's really interesting because you'll see one project that has a tremendous amount of community pushback and has trouble getting through a, what looks like a straightforward rezoning process to get to the density to add units. But you'll have a, other community projects that go straightforward through the process, they get it done, they get built. And what they don't get often get is attention. Uh, there was a, uh, we, we were invested in a project that replaced um, 80 apartment buildings that were built in the aftermath of uh, Dr. King's assassination. You know, in the year that de de devastated many cities, New Haven, you know, all the places where we list guest offices from DC, uh, Boston, New York, um, LA, all had major um, uh, devastating riots in the aftermath. And they, they, those stood for uh, years, and then some affordable housing was built, but it wasn't modern and dense. Uh, the way you would build today in a growing community. So, you know, DC had six decades of population loss, and then when the population started to grow, and after 2000, you know, this, people were, and had, they had some money, they wanted to add density. So they took that parcel of land and they built their building, it's under construction, I went by it last week. Um, they're building like 220 replacement apartments and 100 market rate units. And it sounds like a great project, but what it doesn't get is, for better or worse, there's no real way to celebrate this accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we see very, uh, we see the market kind of steering away from talking about their successes because they don't want to bring, you know, a laser uh, poetry to the work that, that, that can be devastating and can derail a lot of important density projects. And, and Peter, did you want to follow up on that? Well, yeah, my perspective just kind of on this question and overall, just to set a frame of reference is it really is a private sector builder um, background. I was over 20 years with a major, couple major home builders building market rate communities, housing, commercial facilities throughout the country. That segued into my work with HomeAid that Cameron mentioned, which is really a building industry nonprofit focused on taking our resources as builders to the homelessness issue. And in the markets, we're in 20 markets now, finding local builders or national builders locally um, to build for homeless organizations that are dealing with the aftermath of the ultimate outcome of the housing affordability crisis, which is homelessness, and trying to find places for them to be while they get wraparound services from the service providers that uh, are experts at it, and they get back out uh, self-sufficient, self-sufficiency and then get more people into them. So um, it's more of a uh, private sector perspective on the housing, but from what I've heard, you know, I know we'll get into this in a lot more depth, but just the whole idea of land use, zoning restrictions, being so down and dirty at the local level, being little labyrinths that you have to, uh, you know, navigate. As a national builder, we were at, you know, 30, 40 markets around the country, every single market's different, and not just every market, but within a market. I mean, I'm, I'm in Denver now, and I built in Denver. 
you think, okay, city of Denver is fairly you know, progressive and all that. Well, there's 270 municipalities within the Denver, Boulder, Colorado Springs area. So in each of these areas, you have to have a different set of rules, different set of uh, approvals, and it, it just makes it, you know, time equals money when you're developing housing. The longer it takes, the more requirements you have to meet, you know, fees, costs, whatever, it adds to the price of that housing, and that's why when you see that chart with the median price of housing, builders want to build at the affordable level. There's a huge market at that level, and there's a lot of home builders that are focused just on entry level, but entry level has gone from being 100,000 to 400,000, and, you know, incomes have not kept pace with that. It's not a problem that's going to fix itself. So I want to pick a little bit about, you know, you often hear the sound by the media that the housing affordability crisis is a homelessness crisis or, or vice versa. And so um, I, I wonder if you can say whether or not you agree with that. Um, and on top of that, you know, what are kind of some tools that you've encountered kind of making this transition from the private market to nonprofit? And this goes for all of you, but I think specifically for following up on Peter. Um, what are, what are some sort of like financing levers that have worked in the private sector right. for trying to get developers to move towards right. providing this affordable segment? Well, I mean, the homelessness crisis is a housing crisis. I mean, it's based on the housing crisis. Title of my new book. Actually, it's not so I'm stacking the book. I didn't write this. A professor at the University of Washington, but it's a, a really in depth academic um, analysis it's called Homelessness is a Housing Problem. And it's, it's really well regarded in the industry and all the groups that have been focused on homelessness are, are so glad this is being brought to life that, you know, we focus on, yeah, homelessness is a crisis. And there's the charts that you showed that showed, you know, chronic homeless at 125,000. That's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, homelessness uh, is spread throughout, you know, economic classes uh, and geographically, I mean, it's... Stuff happens. Only 25% of the homeless are the chronically homeless that people associate with homelessness. The people you see on the streets, the people that are, you know, in parks and sleeping under uh, overpasses. 75% are just people who had situational things happen in their life, whether a bad choice of their own, just bad luck, economic dislocation, loss of a job, domestic abuse, mental health issues, substance abuse issues. Things that make one vulnerable to homelessness. But what this book and what, you know, the common thinking now is you, you can't look at, it's too easy to look at the individual and blame them for being homeless. You screwed up. And yeah, we're gonna, we need to fix this, but, you know, it's really your fault. As opposed to homelessness being a structural issue and looking at the structural um, components in our society, poverty, discrimination, you know, economic uh, recessions, what have you, but the one structural thing that this, this book and, and academic research shows, the one structural issue that tracks across all the markets with the major homelessness issues, problems, crises, is the price of housing and the availability of housing. Because Chicago, Cleveland, um, cities in the southeast, I mean, they're all subject to the same economic issues and all these other issues I described. Um, they don't have homelessness issues of any scale. Housing is very affordable in those markets. And if you look at those on that graph that showed the most heavy regulatory markets and the price associated <laughs> price is high, you could that graph would be it would be yeah. That's also the homelessness graph. So the cities to the right of that are where your worst homelessness is, not just in the country but in the world. The U.S. has six of the worst ten, six of the twenty worst homeless cities in the world. I don't have the map you're referring to, but HUD has also done a breakdown of this. Yeah, by, and it looks just as you mentioned, just like the PTI ratio on that map. Yeah, so homelessness is, is a housing problem, and I think the key to resolving that part of it is stop looking at it as an individual problem. Start looking at it as a structural problem. Focus on the source of that, which ultimately is a high cost and low availability of housing, and in enacting policies at the national and the local level to encourage housing, get more housing built. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that, there's definitely a theme into that. 
I mean, I think there's the same structural problem with the delivery of supportive services. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the the you do have this distribution of a lot of people who are homeless for a very short period of time, um, and it's transitional and it's uh, probably I think in the south it's probably it's hidden uh, with people staying with other people um, who are not on a place of their own. And that's not an option if you have a one-bedroom apartment in the same way it might be if you have a rural three-bedroom uh, house. But um, but where there is a, the, the, there's been a very successful effort to combat chronic homelessness, particularly for veterans. And that has and if you look at that, that provides a template for mm -hmm. folks who have multiple uh, challenges um, with really an array of really accessible on-site supportive services like. It's, it's called housing first often, to some extent, that like you move in and get yourself set up and then you go. And I mean, that was, I think that grew out of, I remember being in New York, like taking a busload of folks from Grand Central Station to a 900 bed shelf, one room, what's a 900 bed shelf? Yeah, the old arm, so there was money in it. Um, and I think it was like, we've got to just, we can't, uh, people won't respond. These shelters are so bad, nobody's going to move into them. If we can get them into, you know, get it chronically homeless people into some place where they can have a door to shut and a light to turn off, where they can start to repair their their lives, and I think that's proven successful. No, I think that's right. The support of, I used to work in the supportive housing industry as a developer, and a subset of affordable housing really is treating the person holistically, not just a shelter, but really support services to get them back on their feet. So I think it's a very successful model. But again, this requires incredible uh, government resources to build the housing and to support the services for the housing. And I really think that that's 85% of affordable housing in this country is built with the low income housing tax credit to some form of shape, right? So without government subsidy at the federal level, and we can talk about ways that are currently being considered to increase that, that funding, um, we won't ever be successful addressing the short supply of housing. Yeah, so I mean, I think it sounds like we're all kind of in agreement that homelessness is a housing problem, as the book argues, or that this, this idea of affordability and homelessness kind of go hand in hand, or I think we can kind of put that one aside for now. I want to actually pivot back to something that, that Julie said at the beginning about kind of. Um, thinking about moving forward with new housing supply in an equitable way, or, or kind of, to use a dirty word in this room, the not in my backyard debate. Um, and this, this question is kind of geared more towards Ramon, um, maybe working at LISC. Um, I think you've probably seen a lot of this, but, um, and, and obviously everyone feel free to chime in here, but um, a common concern, and I've experienced this just talking with um, local governments in my research, is that, um, below market rate projects often engender strong feelings. No one likes change, as, as we mentioned in the beginning. Um, and so I guess how do you navigate this kind of um, debate between uh, people who are worried potentially about gentrification if you're introducing housing that's much nicer or at a much higher rate than what's existing in the neighborhood, or on the, the opposite side, uh, people fleeing from units that they see as being too affordable. So how, how do you balance those distributional aspects? That's great. No, I, I, um, yeah, I mean, we have this, we do a lot of housing work in all kinds of housing. And we've been trying to come up with a, a lens, and we've said we're, we're, we're about quantity, we're about quality, we're about equity, and we're about inclusion. And if we can get all four of those things at once, that's great. But at least we try to do as many as we can. Um, and I think what, you know, to go back to what you said about the politics of this stuff, I mean, a lot of the anxieties that people have that get reflected through policies and restrictive steps and things like that are not based in fact, right? Like, having been through a couple cities that have gentrified, there was the affordable housing took, usually took an under a dilapidated building and turned it into quality housing that was safe and well run and well managed. And, you know, city, the neighborhoods gentrified around it. So, you know, and, and in some cases, some of these neighborhoods, you know, minority, uh, primarily minority, and primarily, you know, led by minority um, elected officials or community leaders, you know, they wanted to have uh, some of that market-made development. So, 
in practice, I think that was one of the big things is that there are misperceptions that doing an affordable housing project in your building, in your neighborhood is going to bring down values. And I think it either, it, it's investment is investment and, and developers like to see, they have the same eyeball test as everybody else and they, if they see a rundown property, they look at it one way, if they see a well run, you know, quality affordable housing project, it looks like a good housing. And so it tends to be that developers are, you know, like a herd, like Professor Schiller says, they, they follow each other and whether a credit building is affordable or not doesn't seem to be determinative on whether on what comes next. Although there are very important to have communities at the center of that to have some kind of plan. Um, and, and, you know, we're working on a project in Anacostia where we've been working with the community to set an equitable development plan for, I think, 15 years in advance. We're trying to build something like the High Line called the 11th Street Bridge. Um, and in every time that you ask the community, they want a mix of housing. So um, it is possible to get to consensus. And I think to the extent that like, you can show you know, the academic evidence that you're not uh, doing, you're not, gonna, you're not hurting your community, you're strengthening. I think the anonymity phenomenon is a vocal minority needs to be pushed back or the countervail with people in a community that do want development and these government investments that are transformative. And in New York, we have a very active, yes, in my backyard, countervailing the nimbyism. And I think community, uh, community institutions like churches, religious organizations, other things, other groups that are based in a community that want to attract this development and this investment have to speak up and be enabled to push back on a vocal minority who are protecting, you know, they say their home values or their neighborhood or whatever, but are often, as you say, misinformed and often a minority in the community. And I think that's why, you know, we have to empower other groups to speak up. And looking forward, I mean, you know, if you're in a suburban neighborhood and you had a shopping mall and that was like the center of your community, you better figure out how to reuse. You gotta bring density because you, you, the shopping, you know, the shopping malls are dying, right? You got all this land, and if you want to have your nice little main street with the cafe and the bistros, you got to have more customers. And if they're paying all their money in rent, they're not going to go to the cafes and the restaurants and the yoga studios and everything else. So, I mean, just if I think there's a lot of forward thinking that in, in which affordable housing, expansion, development, density, all these things, that they're they're winning strategy. Yeah, and just to add, so. To make a distinction, Jody talks about affordable housing and 80% of the affordable housing you build for tax credits. That's affordable with a capital A. From a private sector standpoint, just building affordable housing, affordable housing that will attract the entry level customer, um, you're looking at the same issues as far as density and uses. Um, it's not so much having a you know, affordable project that's targeted towards a, you know, probably a blighted area or an area that needs redevelopment to it. But just talking about the suburbs, where you have all these abandoned shopping malls and other, you know, abandoned Air Force bases, abandoned airports in Denver's case, we moved the airport, huge, ma largest master plan in the country, very well thought out, but went through years of political wrangling because the only way to get the affordability in there is to increase density. And especially if you have a transit system that you're trying to utilize, you've got to build density around those projects. But people in that local area, you know, they look at the density numbers and it may not be, oh, I don't want the wrong people here. It's just like, it's not attractive. I want to protect my own values. I want to have my big lots and I want to have my parks and I want to, you know, have all the things in your community that aren't necessarily conducive to having affordable, affordable housing. It's the newbies that control what's going on in this country as far as uh, local housing. And, and yeah, but there's other voices. I mean, we, we're working, so if you kind of, you know, DC is like a, Pyramid, or a, not a pyramid, but a, about a square, a little bit of part the gate to Virginia. Um, if you go sort of straight east of the capital, there's um, you're into Maryland, and it's called Prince George's County. And there's a uh, there's again municipalities, historic municipalities, many of which were formed, uh, founded by you know uh, freed slaves who moved there. And you know, so long legacy. Some of those communities, municipalities, were actually neighboring, and some were all white, and some were all you know, black and demographics now it's almost uh, you know 99% African American. Um, 
But it, so the DC region, I did this math the other day, had added two million people in the last 30 years, just a big growth. And these communities have had zero population growth, right? So I mean, you know, we stopped redlining. When did we stop redlining? Like in the 1970s? I don't know that we have stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we removed the lines, but like for not, an area not to have any density growth, not to participate in that. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of a complacency because it was a suburban bedroom community where people could get a, uh, join the civil service and go home to their, to their ranch house or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of voices there that are like, well, this is sustainable. You know, we have to have some price appreciation. We have to have, we have to use our metro stations, our tra transit stations, build around that. Like, there's a lot of support out there. It's conflict. It's just, a, I think it's a process where you kind of have to get your, you have to get a little into it. Right, and yeah. your project hopefully will pop up the other side with approval, but um, it's it's not a, a debate that's you can avoid. You actually have to kind of work to change it to make it, and that's where I think inclusion is part of it. Is making sure that the people who are there, when change starts, are still there when when the neighborhoods are, are changed. And so, what about I guess so we've talked now about um, the NIMBY versus YIMBY kind of contingents in cities, and we've also hinted at the the fact that. Unlike a lot of other countries in the U.S., zoning and land use regulation is set at such a local level. You have these town planning boards that might be populated by those with more NIMBY sentiments um, that have a lot of leeway to block new projects. So what about going to the source and, and trying to essentially undo some of the, the red tape in the permitting process or in the development of, of new structures? Um, so can you speak to like maybe what are some nudges we can enact for local governments to try and streamline their processes, make them more harmonious across localities? Um, you know, like a standard app. Yeah, <laughs> or you know, like the, the zoning atlas, There's a, a, a real like you know, just kind of on the descriptive, trying to make zoning more comparable across cities. Well, a number of states, many of them at the upper right hand corner of the chart are really looking at enacting change at the state and regional level, because as long as you have people in city and municipal governments that are pushing back, and even if the government isn't pushing back, they get sued. They, there's so many opportunities for localities to get mired in, uh, in things that stop these more progressive ideas, that it really has to come, I think, either at the regional or state level. A number of states, California, Washington, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York is trying to enact at the state level zoning override of things, taking some of the uh, tools away from groups that stall housing. But I think you, there are communities that don't want housing and don't want growth and are very indie-centric uh, are not going to adopt. And those are the high opportunity areas. Oh, I'm totally not supposed to say that anymore because it implies low opportunity in the but. Um, in areas with, with better schools and better transportation and, and better parks and other amenities, um, those communities are very resistant to change. And unless they're told uh, by a higher authority that they have to let other housing come in, it won't happen. So I'm very pessimistic that even given a menu of options, most communities, particularly opportunity communities, are going to are going to move in that direction. And I agree with Jelly completely. And it is troubling because if you look at common or recent trends, there are states that are trying to be progressive in this. States would have big problems like New York, um, Colorado, where I am, has got a lot worse in affordability and homelessness, and Hawaii, using three examples. All three in the last year, the governor has run on a major platform of housing affordability and reducing homelessness. Governor Hochul's plan that uh, went to the legislature for 800,000 new housing units spread throughout the different municipalities. I don't know the details of the whole thing other than the fact it was killed at the legislature by the local areas that didn't want to be told to have affordable housing or have more housing. Same in Colorado. The governor of Colorado, very popular, Democrat, controlled the state and the house. We did trust in affordable housing, put in a bill to basically have a state overlay to restrict the local municipalities, 270 of them, from restricting affordable housing and housing in general. It got blown up at the legislature as well, even with control of, of both chambers. Um, so now he's put out an executive order saying everyone needs to study. 
We know where that happens. <laughs> and Hawaii, which is the most expensive housing in the country, has the most laborious land approval zoning process. It takes, from you coming to a project, you've identified, you've designed and everything, getting that at the various levels that need approval and various processes, it takes seven to 10 years to pull a permit on that. Not a lot of deep, not a lot of builders have a deep pocket to wait 10 years to get a first dollar back. Um, governor came in, once again, big mandate, created a national or a, a statewide commission that usurped all the power from a lot of these planning organizations, actually installed as a housing chief, the woman who had run, been running our home aids organization in Hawaii, helping homeless with a lot of tiny homes, a lot of initiatives, put her in as chief housing officer. The first public meeting, it was like a riot. Uh, and there's hundreds of people just attacking them. She got personal threats, her family's threats. She ended up quitting after three months. And now the governor's backing off and saying, okay, never mind. Because it was an emergency, he used an emergency yeah. order to override the legislature, because the legislature hadn't done anything in decades, so and now he's backing up. Okay, well, maybe that was too draconian. Let's, you know, let's back it up. Ultimately, they need to get reelected. The people down at the, the NIMBY level, they're listening to the people on the ground. And so, while it would be great to have an atlas or a playbook, there's certainly there's success stories too. I'll just blast things. So, a, a positive success story, so I don't think it's all negative, is, and it's at the city level, is Minneapolis. And Minneapolis, five years ago, decided, okay, we have an affordable housing crisis. We're going to do what it takes. They have the real power and the cooperation at the city level. They essentially eliminated single family only zone, which is pretty serious. Um, and that, that's so dominant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. this is the Midwest. Right. So, I mean, anyway. No question that, uh, well, well, let me just yeah. say that that had a great result. In yeah. five years, Minneapolis built all this multifamily housing, put a lot of money also invested in government subsidized housing as well. Yeah. But their rent increase in the last five years is 1% versus the nation's 31%. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, density, density, density. Yeah. Sorry. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think like Minneapolis, like it's got the. A lot of the new housing is in transit corridors, it's really yeah. replacing industrial. But I do think it sends a message, like again, to the development community, like we're gonna, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna have to design this thing to fan toilets and sandcastle and never gets built. Um, and you know, we just in terms of the process, like there's no avoiding. But we still have to pick a policy class, right? The, 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 you know, right? Like, so you're gonna be in the policy arena on the in this industry, right? So um, you know, faith-based organizations. Um, are out there, and they are pushing this. They, I think, they see this as a housing justice and an equity issue, um, which it is. Um, and but again, I think there's a lot of upsides to just doing it because it's right. I mean, we. I guess you know. I don't. I wouldn't say that that chart um, um, that you had with the uh, affordability, but it, it, it kind of coincides with the decline of cities, of major cities. So I think that to situate. Both cities and suburbs, you really need to they need to embrace this and find the people who support it and take advantage of um, moments of justice that have found the, you know, the murder of George Floyd to really institute some of those policies. So I think that's kind of the, the micro level perspective on this. And it sounds like you know we're kind of reaching some consensus that it, there needs to be some action at the state or the federal level in order to get the, the local governments to, to remove some of this red tape. Um, I want to now turn to the U.S. affordability crisis and maybe at a more global standpoint. So um, what I mean by that is that many have argued that actually the affordability problem in the U.S. has made um, the U.S. lose its competitive edge in terms of bringing new talent to the country. And that's, so that's one angle to which there's a global component to this. But there's also kind of the question of how do we encourage um, global investors to come into the affordable segment of the U.S. housing market. So, for instance, we know that since the Great Recession, there's been a big runoff in institutional investors in the real estate market, particularly in the single-family home market during COVID. Um, you know, Blackstone's B-Read portfolio holds 67 billion in assets, of which 80% are rental housing units. Okay, so there's a lot of global capital that's flowing into the U.S. housing market. How do we get it uh, to go towards the affordable segment? Any, any ideas there? Well, in New York, let's just talk for a moment about global competitiveness. In New York State, 
the governor attracted and Chuck Schumer and, uh, you know, Congress delivered to Syracuse, New York, a micron chip factory, billions of dollars in investment just outside of the city of Syracuse. And now what they're finding is they can't attract anyone because no one can move. There's no housing. There's no plan for housing. There's NIMBYism going on across Syracuse. It's a, and we just have written columns about this. It's affecting our global competitiveness, our lack of affordable housing. We can't build a chip plant because there's no place for the people to live who would work there. I think that that's as dramatic as it can get in explaining why this is a really important finance issue at the highest level. I think that global investment is going to chase profits, right? Uh, there must be an opportunity because uh, we're seeing such a flood of investments into, um, into our real estate uh, assets. I, I don't know that we need to attract more. Uh, if anything, um, we need to somehow leverage that interest into the affordable space. And it's just the prices and the delays because of zoning are driving the cost up so much. It, people are exiting the market. It's, it's not a profit-making enterprise anymore. So I think there's going to have to be some regulatory relief on, on allowing capital that's, that's be turning a profit on rental units to also invest in, in the more, uh, housing for the more vulnerable. You're going to have to leverage that interest. You have seen um, institutional investment in rental, especially single-family entry-level uh, rental in the past five years. It's been a, a huge push. And a lot of it's, it's targeted more towards affordable markets like the Southeast and Southwest. Um, but you've seen the investments go up from like, I think 10% roughly of the, the single family rental market would be institutional to like 20% in five years. I mean, it's been dramatic. And that's good. But it's a double-edged sword because it's crowding out people that would be buying those homes as first-time home buyers, and there's, it's become quite a problem now because they're chasing the profits, and that's you know you want that's what capitalism does. And I don't sound like much of a private sector capitalist right at this moment, but you know, uh, first-time buyers that builders would are trying to attract are being forced out by institutional buyers who get in, control a big chunk of the market, like they own twenty percent of the market in Jacksonville. Rates have gone up. Yeah, it's, it's driving it's, inflation. Yeah. And, and home price and rental inflation is driving the overall national inflation. Yeah. Right? It was like 90% of the increased inflation was in the housing costs. So yeah. it's really crippling the economy generally. It, it's, also, it's also a weak I don't get. And I mean, the street side of like, we think this would create more demand is that people would build more houses, right? If this big investor firms are buying up all the houses, then that's demand, and you get, maybe you know how that works, right? You teach that every day, right? So, <laughs> you take my real estate back. <laughs> there you go. But, um, but it's, it's, people are really suspicious at the community level. Um, and, um, you know, the, there, are, there are evidence that we, we've done projects that were like scattered to like single family homes. And the problem is the maintenance. The maintenance is so off schedule. If you have an apartment building where every, faucet installed on the same day, they tend to wear out. And you tend to know what you had a stock of standard faucets to replace those faucet washers, right? If you have if you buy a mixed bag of 60 homes in Baltimore, you know, you never know which faucet what, you know, it's all been it's a mix. It's, so I think there's probably a tech way to properly manage this stuff, but I would just think that in six or seven years they're gonna unwind this. And what, what's that about? Like, it's a strange, to me, there's, if you want to buy a lot of housing, you know, buy an apartment building, at least. I, it just, I, it comes to, you know, you're always at the mercy, I'm sure, you, with your, with your uh, repair staff in, a, in an affordable housing project or a market rate project. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been, there's a shortage in that market, too, so I don't get it. I mean, it sounds a little bit like there are these scale effects. That, you know, these large institutional investors, they buy up a Apple's and Oranges set of, of yeah, buildings, and then they try to you know, kind of homogenize them. Yeah. And to do that, you really need scale. And so you know, I think one of the takeaways maybe is that we need to prop up some of the smaller investors to induce more competition to get, to get out of those scale effect yeah. uh, issues. Um, but so you know, now that we've talked about 
the, the micro level, kind of the, the NIMBY and, and land use and zoning regime, as well as at the macro level, what's been going on in the housing affordability arena. I want to, and perhaps on a little bit of a lighter note, turn it internally to SOM. Um, and you know, so SOM is educating um, leaders for business and society, and I think all three of you can speak to kind of these public private nonprofit partnerships. Um, that have worked, and, and perhaps some, some small successes that you've had in your careers in inducing more housing supply and, and getting at affordability. So I'm wondering if you can kind of um, you know, relate to the SOM mission and talk about some of those successes in more detail. Look, I, what I do, as I mentioned, is the intersection between government and private industry and negotiate how governments can do a better job with public resources building privately owned and managed assets. So, I mean, I think that the whole affordable housing industry is that intersection of public-private public joint ventures. And over the decades we've been building affordable housing, my kind of affordable housing, um, it's created tens of thousands of jobs and I feel like it's a really robust industry that has a lot of successes, meeting some challenges now, but I would say that the affordable housing industry across the United States is a, a true working public-private partnership that was born out of a regulatory environment that created these funds and the Tax Credit Act of 87, and I, you know, I, I would encourage people to really look at uh, this growing industry, and housing is a major force uh, in the U.S. economy, and I think the affordable housing piece is an important part of it. Well, I would throw out the organization I mentioned before, Homemade America, that I was running for a while, um, that is a, it's been around 35 years now, it's a building industry initiative program to basically give back to the community by addressing, you know, the ultimate thing that home builders can do to help the community, and that is provide housing to those who don't have it. And, you know, Altruism, but also some sense of okay, builders aren't the evil guys, the developers knocking down your trees and killing your birds all the time. <laughs> so it, it grew from that to where we do have 20 markets around the country. We built thousands of units. Um, I think the latest stat is because we typically build for organizations that are for the transitionally homeless, so they're coming in and getting out and the beds turn over. We've now housed more than 700,000 people. So that's a big number over 30 years. But the missing piece is that's kind of the, the private nonprofit because we work with the service providers who are actually the ones that run the housing and run the program. We just build them. What we haven't had is the public um, involved. And the thing that we've been trying for that we've not been able to get is if a builder does this in a community and provides all this housing for people without housing, in the community, there should be some recognition of that when the builder goes in to get a housing approval for the project that might be an entry level project. Let's get some credits. I mean, a lot of times when you go in for a project, you, they hit you with the sewer fee and the streets fee and the school fee and this fee and that fee and everything. It's like, okay, we want you basically to cover all the costs for the community up front. Well, how about you get a credit for the homeless uh, project? So, so you have to keep government working with that model to kind of make it more attractive to builders so it's not purely charitable, that it actually has some benefit towards their Main Street business. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to take away, that, like, no matter what we have complained about or, or, <laughs> or diagnosed here, I mean, this strategy works. And I have had a very SOM, bizarre post-SOM career in that I basically at the same place I was when I got out of SOM 25 years ago. 26 almost. 26, yeah. So um, the benefits of that, and I, and I had like 10 jobs in eight years before I got here. So it wasn't like I ever thought I would do this, but one aspect of that is like I've had projects that we've invested in affordable housing projects, literally in my front yard and my backyard. Um, one day I was up on top of the roof looking with the HUD secretary at the time because we put some solar panels up there and I'm looking down at my own yard thinking, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> um, so, um, but really, you get the sense. Of, I mean, it's unique that I get to meet. I get to stay in touch with some of the people that we've helped. Um, and you know, we had a we had an intern this summer, graduated from a prestigious university, um, 
you know, undergrad, grew up in one of our neighborhoods. I realized she grew up in one of the projects, you know, one of the buildings that we had, that had been redeveloped before I joined. Um, and, you know, so it's just like watching people, people do, can, if they're in affordable housing, they can create a stable life, take advantage of the opportunities that are being developed around them, and then take that step of being the first one to go to college. I will say, it's not, your work's not done. I mean, when she started, um, it had been, because of the pandemic, she hadn't really had an in-person internship, and, um, and so there was a lot of, like, that office stuff that you maybe would catch from other generations, but also realizing that, which I knew from some experience, was that sometimes you graduate from college and you yourself don't have capital to start off your life, and you may be housing challenged. And we were worried whether this uh, internship was going to proceed. But, um, so I think that there's a particular benefit you get when you go buy buildings or developments that you play any part in. And you, you realize that whether indirectly or directly, you, you can sense that this they did help transform some of the slide. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts. Um, I and mean, we're not going to solve the affordability issue from your perspective, but moving in the right direction and moving through these issues in the program. So, in the last few minutes, I just want to hear uh, a few thoughts from the audience. Uh, and we're running a little bit short on time, but. So Tom McFarland is going to, um, on behalf of the audience, so those of you who submitted questions to the QR code, um, select to run on behalf of, of all of you. And Tom is the president of the Real Estate Club. Uh, I tried to, I looked at all the other questions, but probably do that for similar, where I saw themes. So uh, the first one is, I mean, we talked a lot about regulation and uh, rezoning and that kind of stuff, but are there any specific innovations or technologies even that address affordable housing? I'll jump in. I mean, housing, you know, is, is, is being built today pretty much the way it was 70 years ago, 75 years ago. And there have been a lot of innovations tried, and a lot more in other countries, to be honest. They've they got such dense areas and affordability issues. Um, they've done a lot more modular housing. Um, Building the back, basically building components, just taking the site and slapping them together. And with some success. I mean, affordability in Japan is one of the best for And they've got all the. They have no density constraints. No, yeah, yeah. At all. They yeah. national level. Go up. Uh, so yeah. National level policy <laughs> with, with uh, you know, high density is not a problem. Tokyo's most affordable city in the, in the world. Oh. But, um, uh, just on manufactured housing, this yeah. group preservation affordable housing co-op, they're doing a yeah. 13-story building. And it's I went to see the factory, it starts off as nothing, and then they assemble everything, including the back splat, the tile, the the appliances, and they truck it there and snap it together like that Lego. I mean it's amazing. Yeah. So I do think that that's transformational. And if it's because then at least you're compressing the construction period and you've got some sort of quality thing that you don't have like a you know, your GC was sick that day and had to have well, a get out of nature. I mean, homes are the biggest manufactured product that's made in the outdoors. I mean, think about that in those parts of the country. That's yeah. crazy. You don't have a factory that's protected. When you, when you can do more modular housing construction uh, in factories, I mean, that's obviously a huge for people. Okay, sure. Uh, given that, uh, I don't have a stats on this myself, but I'm sure. A lot of the uh, low income housing tax credit uh, developments can sometimes be, can be more expensive than market rate development. Uh, is that a challenge that's being addressed? And then where does mixed income um, developments uh, factor into solving this problem? Uh, tax credit projects are more expensive than any other kind of construction of in some country because of the layers of accountability and oversight and bond counsel. And it's a very, I used to work on Wall Street and mortgage backed securities. This is more complicated than collateralized mortgage obligation debt. I mean, it is complicated, and so all the layers of oversight and every investor has their own counsel and there's punch list is very expensive construction. And the quality has to be very high because it's a government investment. So uh, ways to streamline that, everybody's always working. Uh, municipalities, they we try and, and condense the oversight to try and have like one set of eyes that everybody agrees to the checklist. And, and streamlining bureaucracy brings down a lot of the costs. But 
by nature of the, of the tax credit process, it's just more expensive in the nature of financing. And because it's built to government standards, it's often uh, a lot higher quality construction than some market rate. You know, so yes, it is more expensive, and people are always trying to find ways to cut back. But it's a big industry now. Yeah, it's a mature industry. Yeah. I mean, the other piece out there, I think, is really um, to be seen how it played out, but you should be definitely aware of the Inflation Reduction Act. It's just like, so we have never had this much money. I mean, I don't even know how to say it. It's like a giant, enormous pile of money, a stack on a pile of money. That's all got to flow into the housing market, much of it into the affordable housing market. And um, it's just at the cost of figuring out how even the first dollar moves. And it has a clock on it. And it has a clock. Yeah. So it's the, you know, the, the technology from the technology, the affordability, and the operating expenses. I mean, that, would be, that could be a huge um, uh, change, transformation people should be aware of. One thing I want to throw in there is, and I don't have the answer to this, but the main private sector building companies, I mean, there's you know, dozens around the country, we build about a million and a half homes a year. They don't get involved in the government housing projects, the low income tax credit, the, you know, Hope 6, these various programs. At, at our company, I was uh, the head of corporate development for a while, so we looked into getting into Hope Six pro program. We looked into the tax credits. We looked into military housing. And the big problem is, is that the private sector is not allowed to do what it does best, which is build the housing. Tell us what you need on a big picture. We'll design it. We'll build it. Let us do it. You know, let's not report every time we we install the nail on the board. Well, I think one answer, one answer to grow the pie is really looking at non litac non-government subsidy, and really cross subsidizing. So in New York. Until recently, we had a tax program that allowed more market rate development if you provide 20 to 35 percent affordability right. in different rates, and it cross subsidized, and it didn't have all of the extra layers of bond counts. Yeah. The money was really in the project, and I think if we're going to successfully address the homelessness and the housing supply problem, we have to look at other ways, like mixed income projects, mixed use projects that really take some of the cash flow from those higher income units or from that real estate, retail and office industrial space development and cross subsidize and get it out of the hands of government. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're not going to solve this unless the private sector is heavily involved in it. The private sector, tell them what you need, tell them what the requirement is, 20% affordable, whatever, and then let them do it because they'll find the efficient way to do it and make money on it at the same time meet the societal needs. And if you don't have the private sector, which builds 80% of the housing in this country, involved in addressing the situation, it's going to take a long time to fix. Oh, no, no, I think we need to adjourn at the top of the hour, but I just want to, you know, just a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> one more thing why I have you all here, so in terms of real estate programming, any of you want to be involved in these events, then please um, uh, let me know. But um, our alumni real estate conference will be occurring on October 27th, so please mark that in your calendars. It's open to Yale students. Uh, you just need to register. Um, and then we will be doing another one of these colloquial events. It's a different um, topic. So please keep an eye out for that. And thanks again for coming, and thanks for the panelists. Thank <laughs> you.